you would in your Bibles this morning to the uh, 12th chapter of Luke. As we uh, continue, as we continue our study there, let's begin in verse uh, 22. Just read the whole section through verse 34 as we finish that up today. Luke 12, 22. And Jesus said to his disciples, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat, or about your body, what you will put on. For life is more than food, and the body more than clothing. Consider the ravens, they neither sow nor reap, they have neither storehouse nor barn, and yet God feeds them. Of how much more value are you than the birds? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? If then you are not able to do as small a thing as that, why are you anxious about the rest? Consider the lilies, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass, which is alive in the field today and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, how much more will he clothe you? O oh, you of little faith, and do not seek what you are to eat and what you are to drink, nor be worried. For all the nations of the world seek after these things, and your Father knows that you need them. Instead, seek his kingdom, and these things will be added to you. Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to the needy. Provide yourself with money bags that do not grow old, with the treasure in the heavens that does not fail, where no thief approaches and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this word. Um, Thank you Lord, thank you for the challenges we've heard even this morning. As I consider, Lord, the ministries that you've given uh, Bob and Jan and Bob and Helen, and as I see them even as their age advances, still working, Lord, at what you've called them to do, what a, what a privilege and what a challenge to finish strong. It's amazing how many People in your word struggled with that. And I'm encouraged and I'm inspired to see those who are just continuing on, Lord, in the ministry you've given them. And then I turn around and I think of people like Jesse and Kelly in our own church who are taking the word in their own special way to make it available for translation to 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 people and to tribes that otherwise would never have that opportunity. And I'm excited about that. And I see the young men on this screen, young men. Think of some of the missionaries we support, young couples in Chad and some of the most difficult places in the world. I think of Teresa Vanderford, who was here last week, a young woman taking her nursing skills to Bangladesh. And I'm excited about your word going forth continually through a new generation of people. And then, Lord, I think about how you give us opportunity to share with them by praying for them. Think of Kurt and Melissa and how they minister to the international students in our own area. I think of those who give, those who are perhaps not able to go, not called to go, but they are, we're all called then to give. And um, Lord, it just excites me to see what you do through a little group like us. So thrilled to see people responding to your call on their life and to your will on their life. So thank you. And Lord, as we consider this word this morning, we pray as always that your Holy Spirit will be our teacher. We are never adequate for your word but he is the one who has authored it. And so we look to him to give us insight, to give us inspiration, to give us the courage to be doers of your word. 
Would you please do that for the sake of your son, Jesus Christ, we pray in his name. Amen. Guy goes to his psychiatrist and he says, Doc, I got a problem. Doc says, well, what's your problem? Maybe I can help you. He said, well, it's an identity problem. He said, sometimes I think I'm a teepee and other times I think I'm a wigwam. And the doctor says, oh, there's no problem. I can help you with that. He said, your problem is you're too tense. <laughs> That's pretty bad, huh? Too tense. Universal problem, though, is it not? Too tense. And when you think about it, think how ironic it is that here we are, the most affluent, privileged society in the history of the whole world, which we certainly are. And yet we are also the most stressed out, the most worried, the most anxiety-ridden society in history. No worry goes unnamed. No anxiety goes undefined or undiagnosed or unmedicated. And yet, there doesn't seem to be any relief. Relief seems un unattainable. It's almost like the harder we work at this, the more worried we are. Why is that? Well, as we've looked in the last couple of weeks, the answer is we do not have operating in our life the big God that we've been singing about all morning, right? We have big circumstances and a little God, big us and a little God instead of a big God and a little us. We have bought into the humanistic philosophy, which has defined God out of existence, at least in terms of active interest in our existence. And beloved, you can't eliminate the presence of God from your life without doing serious damage. It simply isn't possible. Sooner or later, that has to catch up with you. And that's what happens because now we're living with, from our perspective, no one at home guiding all of these cosmic processes that are operating on us and you pile on top of that just the daily stress that comes into our lives of, from various sources. And it's no wonder that we have a $55 billion counseling and psychology industry in the United States today. We're worried. The solution to anxiety is not difficult. Implementing it is infinitely difficult, it seems. The solution is there many places in the Bible. Let me just give you one. Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. I think these are verses that will be familiar to most of you. Hebrews 12, 1 and 2, where the writer says, let us lay aside, let us lay aside every weight, every worry. Let's lay aside every worry and sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus. Looking to Jesus. Getting our focus on Jesus, the founder and the perfecter of our faith. Trust in a great God and anxiety has to leave the building. Cozy up to anxiety and God leaves the building. And so as we have gone through this passage, we've been looking at seven ways that the Lord shows us, that Jesus tells us in this passage that worry affects our relationship with God negatively. Seven bad things that happen every time we let worry be the defining feature in our life, whatever. I don't care what the worry is. I don't care how real it is. I don't care how awful it is. I don't care what it is. Only bad things can happen when we give way to that instead of trusting in a great God. We've looked at four of those. We'll finish the other three today. But the first one was that worry destroys God's peace where he destroys God's peace. The very word anxious in the beginning of this passage in verse 22 means to be fragmented, to be distracted. It means to be looking in all kinds of directions instead of to the one direction that makes the difference, looking to Christ, as the writer of the Hebrews says. 
Secondly, it defies God's perspective. It defies God's perspective. In verse 23, for life is more than food and the body more than clothing. We don't live like that. We don't believe that. We may believe it intellectually, but our, our, our actions say this life is all there is. And what Jesus is trying to say is no. If this life was all there is, then survival would be the greatest good. It's not. Life is more than food in the body, more than clothing. There's an eternal perspective that we need to pay attention to. Thirdly, worry devalues God's provision. Worry basically looks at the things God has given me and says it's not enough. But beneath that, sort of unspoken, really even unidentified, don't even realize this is what we're doing, but what we're really saying is God messed up. God's not giving me enough. I don't have everything I need here, so I'm going to worry it into existence. It devalues God's provisions. Fourthly, it denies God's providence, as we saw last week. It denies God's providence. What does that mean? It means that God's working in our life, we deny we see a bad thing come into our life and we assume, I know better than God. This should not be happening to me. I'm going to worry it out of existence. And of course, we can't. Worry is us trying to control the uncontrollable rather than embracing the providence of God in our life. He says, you, you, you can't add an inch to your height or a year to your life. So embrace what God has made you, got what God is doing in your life, instead of denying his providence. Three more today, then let's look at number five. What does worry do? Worry disavows God's parenthood. Worry disavows God's parenthood. Look at verse 30. For all the nations of the world seek after these things, and your father knows that you need them. Do you find it kind of fascinating that right in the middle of this passage, Jesus suddenly starts talking about the nations? Why is he doing that? Here's why. He's reminding the disciples that they are different. They are different. The nations do not have a loving, heavenly Father. But you, if you're a believer, you do. So why would you live like them? They should be worried. Anxiety should characterize their life. Their anxiety is well-placed. They're on their own in the universe. They should worry in the morning, they should worry at noon, and they should wake up in the middle of the night and worry some more. Because they don't have the father that you have. But by your worry, you are living like them and you are disavowing the fatherhood of God. Wow. Totally different for believers. Your father knows that you need them. Food and clothing he's talking about there. So he says, quit living like the rest of the world. Anxiety disavows God's fatherhood. You look like the unbeliever who has no recourse when you have the greatest father, the most loving father that anyone could possibly have who loves you more than you will ever know. So live like it. Pursue his agenda instead of yours. Get on board with what he's doing in the world. You know, the, the more you do that, the more you submit yourself to the fatherhood of God, not only the, will, you, will you have more happiness in your life, not only will you be fulfilling your God-ordained mission in life, but you'll be laying up treasure in heaven, beloved. I'm going to come back to that theme in a moment, but you'll be laying up treasure in heaven. How would you like to get the end of your worry-filled life only to find that everything you were worried about came in the salvation package the moment you accepted Christ as Savior? But that's what's going to happen to a lot of people because they are disavowing the fatherhood of God. When, beloved, when, when, believers, when believers are pursuing the same ambitions, setting their sights on the same goals, listening to the same songs, reading the same literature, not saying we shouldn't do any of those things, but there needs to be more that, to our life. When we are having the same anxieties and when we're pursuing the same methods as the world is doing, something is dreadfully wrong. 
We have left the Father behind, and it's either because we don't really have a Heavenly Father, which is possible, or it's because we're not trusting in the Heavenly Father who is there in charge of everything. Philippians 4.19 says, but my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches in glory. Is he rich? He'll supply all your needs according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. That's the promise. So why worry? Your father knows you have need of them. I'll tell you why we worry. We worry because we're pursuing our own agenda. We're pursuing because we think we know better the Father. We don't really think of it that way, but at the heart of every worry, I mean, if you just sit down, the next time worry is going through your mind. And listen, beloved, I'm as, I'm as prone to this as you are. I don't stand up here as a, as a shining example today. But the next time worry is infecting your life, stand back and say, in what area am I pursuing my own agenda instead of God? In what, how do I think I know more than God does about this situation? And then how can I give it to him? My heavenly Father. What good does it do to have a heavenly Father and you, don't, and you don't take advantage of Him? I remember vividly, vividly, my first day of school. We lived on a farm in eastern Nebraska, near, not far from Columbus, where Dr. Kennedy grew up. And on this farm, there was a country school, District 54, that had grades K through eight, about 25 kids from the surrounding area would go to this school. And so on my first day of school, I was all primed. You know, I had school clothes, had to put them on in the morning, had to change them as soon as I got home at night. Those were the rules. I had a brand new lunch pail that I remember very well, big black lunch pail with a <laughs> brand new thermos in there filled with, filled with uh, milk. And I was, I mean, I was ready. This was gonna be a great adventure. It's about a mile from our house to the school. And so my folks sent me off after they prayed with me that morning to walk down the lane about three quarters of the way was a, was a lane from our house to the main road and then there was a road to the school and I took off thinking everything was great. But the further I went, the more ominous things came into my mind. The most ominous one being the black Angus bull that belonged to our neighbor. And I want to I want to assure you that was not that was it was not a it, it was not an idle threat that was in my mind. Just weeks before, I had seen that black Angus bull get out of the pasture and come up to our corral, where our bull, a normally pretty docile heifer, heifer named Oki, was, and they had a fight between the fence like you've never seen. I was scared to death. It was a frightful thing to watch. And the further I walked, the more I was sure that bull was going to break out of the pasture and get after me. And the further I walked, the more I remembered. The more I remembered, the slower I walked. And the slower I walked, the more I remembered until the first thing you know, I wasn't headed towards school at all. I was headed right back toward home. Of course, mom and dad were well, why, back, why are you back home? So I explained to them what my concern was. And just a few minutes after that, I was walking down that lane with not a care in the world towards school. You know why? Because my hand was in the big farmer hand of my father. And I'll tell you, it made all the difference, beloved. Circumstances hadn't changed at all. The threat was the same as it had been before. But I had new companionship. My hand was in the hand of my dad. And my question to all of us this morning is, is your hand in the hand of the father? Is it? I don't know what the fear is this morning that's driving your life. I don't know what you're hiding. I just know we all are hiding something. There's some fear. There's something that we fear almost more than life. There's fear of loss, of some loss, that we're going to lose a loved one, that we're going to lose a job, that we're going to lose a reputation. There's fear there driving our existence. We've not given it over to the Father. It's time to put our hand in His hand and realize Nothing bad can happen. You say, but what if I do lose my husband, wife, child, mother, father, whatever it is? What if I do lose my job? What if I do lose my reputation? What if everything bad that I'm thinking about, what if it happens? And my, my answer is if you're, if you're trusting in God, God's in charge. 
He will never let anything happen that's not for your good and his glory. Not ever. That's having a big God. That's looking to Jesus, the author and perfecter of our salvation. We don't know what we need to perfect our life. We don't know what we need to perfect our existence. God does. Beloved, don't disavow the fatherhood of God. If there's, if there's one, I don't know that there's one that's major in this whole list, but if there is, I'd say it's this one. Not appreciating, not taking advantage of, not living in the good of the fatherhood of God. Wow, what a privilege. That's why when he asked us to pray, when he taught us to pray, well, how do you start the prayer? Our Father. That's a tremendous privilege. Sixth thing that worry does, it deflates God's pleasure. Say, are you kidding me? We can, we can deflate God's pleasure? Well, to a certain extent, yes. Not in an absolute sense, beloved. His glory will reign at the end of the day. There's no question about that. But God is an emotional being. That's why he's created emotional beings. And Jesus tells us right here that this can happen. Verse 32, he says, Fear not, don't worry, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. What's Christmas like as a parent? As a parent. It's different, isn't it? As a kid, it's all about presents, right? And it's all about getting those presents. But as a parent, is it about... Is it about presents? Is that what revs your engine at Christmas time? As a parent, of course not. As a parent, what you're, what you're going to enjoy is watching your children unwrap the presents, right? Or your grandchildren or whatever the case happens to be. That's what your turn on is as a parent. And that's the feeling that Jesus is appealing to here. He's reminding them, listen, the Father has nothing but your best at heart ever. Always. Always. You can trust him absolutely. His greatest pleasure is to give to you, not to take from you. If he takes from you, it's because you didn't need it. It's a gift. But what really amazes me here is he identifies one of the things the Father wants to give us. What does he want to give us? This is amazing. He wants to give you the whole kingdom of God. That has massive implications. It wants to give you the kingdom of God. You know, we read God's commands. We read God's commands as, I, I don't know, we, we kind of grow up this way. We kind of read them as, you know, limiting, fun prevention, pleasure draining disciplines to obey God. The Commands that he gives us to run our lives. We think of those as things that really are going to take us down. And in fact, they are the exact portal to the most massive joy that you could ever have in the whole universe. The commands of God. No wonder he wants us to open the package. He wants to be the solution to whatever it is that we need instead of allowing us to be the solution to our own problems, which is where we're, we're always going. But in so doing, we deflate the pleasure of God. He has things he wants to give us that he can't because we won't believe in him because we're tracking our own course. It's just like Jesus when he came home to Nazareth and, and they said, do some miracles. And it says he couldn't do any miracles there. Why? Because lack of faith on their part. Now, to get the impact of this, <clears throat> we have to ask, well, okay, what's the kingdom? What's the kingdom? Now, we're going to see this over and over as we go through Luke as we get into the later chapters. But we will see, and, and until you kind of wrap your arms around this, you'll never get the Bible's teaching on the kingdom. The kingdom has two big elements, two phases, if you will, two parts to the kingdom of God. This is what the Jews couldn't get, what we all must get. The first and foremost is that the kingdom of God is the rule of God in people's hearts. That is phase one of the kingdom of God. It's purely spiritual. And that's the reason that Jesus could say certain things. Now, let me just read these. Don't, won't try and look them up, but listen to these. Romans 14, 17. 
Romans 14, 17, Paul says, For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. How do you balance that against all the passages throughout the Bible I could show you over and over and over again about banqueting and eating and drinking in the kingdom of God? They're both true. They're both true. But it starts with his rule in the hearts of people. And that's Paul's point here. The kingdom of God starts with his rule in your hearts. Jesus says to Pilate in John 18, 6, 36, John 18, 36, he says, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not from this world world. Jesus' kingdom at core is a spiritual kingdom that can only be entered by a rebirth. That was the whole point of Jesus' discussion with Nicodemus in John 3. You must be, when he said John 3, 3, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again or born from above, he cannot see the kingdom of God. The entrance requirement is a regeneration renewal of who you are on the inside. It has to start from the inside out. You can never see the outward kingdom until you've been redeemed and regenerated on the inside by repentance and placing your faith in Christ. Jesus tells the Pharisees in Luke 17, 20, the kingdom of God is not coming in ways that can be observed. That means that he's emphasizing there the spiritual side to the kingdom, phase one of the kingdom, if you will. The kingdom begins unseen in the hearts that respond to the gospel of Christ. This was the element that the Jewish people that Jesus was dealing with in those days could never get. They were concentrated totally, 100% on the earthly kingdom. That's what they were looking for. It's all they thought about. It's all they wanted. They didn't think what they were on on the inside made any difference. So they just wanted the outward kingdom. They just wanted the outward benefits. That's all they were looking for. And those will come, beloved, but it has to start with God's rule in the hearts of people. If God hasn't established his kingdom in your heart, you will never be part of his kingdom outwardly. But if he has established his kingdom in your heart, if you have been regenerated, if you have repented your sins and come to him by faith, well, then the promises go through the roof. Luke 13, 29. And people will come from east and west and from north and south and recline at table. Eat in the kingdom of God. I could multiply passages like that. For the sake of time, we won't, but let me just give a summary passage in Revelation 21. Verses three and four, listen to this. He says, behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more, neither shall there be any mourning nor crying nor pain anymore for the former things have passed away. Let me tell you, when, when God has established his kingdom in your heart, one day you turn around and find out you're in the earthly, physical, manifested kingdom of God for the first million years. You're just going to be turning around and saying amazing every time you turn around. That's going to be like that. Amazing. I can't believe this. And Jesus is saying right here, it's the will of the Father. That's what he wants to give you. That's what he wants to give all of us. I want to give you the kingdom. It has to start with the rule of God in our heart. You can't have the second element without having the first. But now notice there's an interesting thing that happens in Luke 12. Verse 32, verse 32 there, he says, it is the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. But if you back up a verse, in verse 31, there's a command there. And the command in verse 31 says, seek his kingdom, and these things will be added to you. So the question you should be asking is, well, if God's given it to me, why do I have to seek it? Aren't those two statements contradictory to each other? Well, to explain that, let me go go back to Christmas for a moment. You're looking under the 
spiritual Christmas tree, right? And there it is. It's a package. It's from the Father. It's got your name all over. It's all wrapped up. It says to whatever, fill in your name. There it is. There it is. But do you see that that package under the tree is of absolutely no benefit, no use, no help to you unless you take it and open it up? Doesn't do you a bit of good, right? It's useless. So that's what it means when he says here, Father wants to give it to you, but you've got to seek it. You've got to open it up. You have to be the one by faith to take it. We're going to see later on in Luke, you're going to be amazed when he talks about how hard it is. He's, he's, he's weighing off here, once again, what we see throughout Scripture, the sovereignty of God, and God does what God wills, and yet there's the responsibility and the accountability of man to do what he is asked to do, and we're asked to seek the kingdom. And so he says, I want you to seek the kingdom. Unwrap the thing that's got your name on. How do we do that? How, what was, what, what's the summary of Jesus' message all the way through the Gospels? The kingdom of God is at hand, right? But what starts that statement? Repent. Repent. Bring your sins. Repent. You know what you bring to God? Forget your good works. Paul said that. I just throw them all away. Consider them trash. What do you bring to God? You bring your sin, beloved. That's the entrance requirement for the kingdom. Repent. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That's the first order of business. Open your heart and repent. In repentance to the Father, seeking his forgiveness on the basis of Christ's death and resurrection on your behalf. That's the biggest <laughs> package under the tree. It's the Father's good pleasure to give it to you if you'll accept it. But there's more. There's more. As we open that package, there's more. Look at verse 33. How do we seek the kingdom further as a believer now? How do we do that? It's not what you think. Sell your possessions and give to the needy. See, boy, that doesn't sound much like a present. That's causing me to go give something. What's that all about? Give it away, what I have, when I'm worried about whether I've got enough, when I'm worried about whether I've got more. Is that... Is that what I should be doing? How can that be good? Or read a little further. Provide yourselves with money bags that do not grow old with a treasure in the heavens that does not fail where no thief approaches and no moth destroys. Jesus is saying, well, you're busy worrying about food and clothing and all the other you know, necessities of life. The Father has given you the gift of giving. Open it up. Open it up. Quit worrying about what you don't have and begin to share what you do have. That, that fills up the money bags of heaven. So he's saying, quit worrying and start investing. Jesus isn't literally saying, give everything away. He's speaking in hyperbole, as he often does here. But what he is saying, the message is, give where and what and how you can and probably most of the time beyond what you think you can. The promise is this, you're not losing it. Listen, here's the reason we're not very good givers. We think when we give it away, it's gone. It seems like it just went, it just transferred from my pocket to somebody else's. And what Jesus is teaching here is that's not the case. You're not losing it. You're just moving it out of time into eternity. When you start really thinking that way, and when you grasp what that really means, it changes your whole attitude toward giving. That's why Jesus is saying giving is a gift. Because you're not moving it from your pocket to somebody else's pocket. You are doing that physically, but spiritually you're moving it from your pocket to your saving account in heaven. And I don't know what that will all mean eventually. I just know it'll be really important because God puts a lot of emphasis on it. You, know, you, you can never, when you're giving with the right, now, if you're, if you're just giving away to earn your way to God, I mean, you're wasting your time and your money. If you're just giving grudgingly, you might as well keep it. You might as well. But 
if you're giving with an attitude that says, I love God, I want this to be for him, I, tr- I really truly want to help those who are in need because I want to love God with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength, and I want to love my neighbor as myself, and therefore I want to give. When you give with that attitude, you can't lose. You never lose a penny. It all gets transferred to heaven where it gains eternal value. Say, how does that work? I don't know. But God says it's true. You know, the, the, the problem is we seek too little, beloved. We, we're, willing to sat, we're, we're, we're willing to settle for things that you can see here, do, feel, touch, here. You know, God wants to give us the kingdom. And we're looking for how do I retire comfortably for 15 years? God wants to give us the kingdom. We want a new Lexus. God wants to give us streets of gold. We want a bigger house. God wants to give us a mansion. We settle for too little. We're, we're, we're seeking too little. Jesus says in Matthew 6, 23, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these other things will be added to you. Seek me first. Give to my cause first. Be part of my agenda first. You know, there was an expensive ski boat one time in a harbor out in uh, Newport Harbor near where we lived in Southern California. It had a it was named, it had a name on it. The name was Matthew 6.33. I looked at that and I thought, you know what? That guy probably thinks God gave him that boat because he gave God something. He settled for too little because he got the boat. But what he didn't do is lay anything up in heaven. That, you, you're settling for a boat when you can invest in heaven? Kent Hughes told me one time, about a car, he came into a church parking lot one time and the car said, had a license plate that said tithe on it, tithe. It was, pretty, it was pretty obvious to see that guy thought he had that new big luxury car because he tithed. He was settling for too little. What's a car in light of eternity? It's up to us. Promise is if we seek him first, he'll take care of the necessities of life. By the way, not the luxuries of life. I don't find anywhere in the Bible where God's promising you new, big new cars here, big boats, or all the rest of it. I mean, if God gives you the money to do that and you can do it in all good kinds, great. As long as that's not first in your life, as long as God is first in your life. I'm not saying all those things are wrong, but where's the priority? What are you, what are you, what are you doing? If, if God was promising, you, you just put me first and I'll give you all these luxuries, Donald Trump would be the most righteous guy in the world, right? I don't think that's the case. I just don't, can't buy that. We settle for too little. We give because we're giving because we love God. We're moving it right out of time into eternity. Man, that's a principle to get a hold of and put to work in your life. C.S. Lewis says it this way. He says, indeed, if we consider, listen to this, if we consider the staggering nature of rewards promised in the Gospels, it would seem that our, that our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. We're half-hearted creatures fooling around with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered to us. Like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he can't imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea, we are far too easily pleased. I think he's right. To be satisfied with even the luxuries of this life is a waste that deflates the Father's pleasure. He wants to give us the kingdom. He wants, so many, he, he wants so much more for us than we do. That's the problem. Seventhly, it depreciates God's person very quickly. Verse 34, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. There will your heart be also. Is your heart where God is or is it in lockdown on this earth? That's the question that Jesus is getting at. We saw a show the other night, and a you know, guy was, his girlfriend was going to go away to San Francisco for six months to follow her career, and then they were going to get back together, and so as she's leaving the airport, he gives her a key to his heart. You know, he, put, he had a little key, and he put a 
bow on it as a cute little thing, and he gave her the key to his heart. Well, 10 years later, after she had established her career in San Francisco and was very successful and everything, she, she comes across the key one day. <laughs> and all of a sudden, she realizes maybe her heart should have been there instead of here. Where's your heart? Is it with the Father? Or did you put a bow on the key and give it to him one day and then you've never looked back since? Never been with him since. Don't care. What is salvation, beloved? Salvation is about submitting wholly and completely to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. That's what it is. Salvation is putting him in the throne of our life instead of myself. Salvation is really owning Christ as the most important, the most precious, the most treasured thing in life. We settle for too little. Salvation is Asaph saying in Psalm 73, verse 26, it's a, it's a great verse. After he got all done looking at all the things that the unbelievers had around him, he finally was just about to lose his, his, his equilibrium. And then he turned around and he said, wait a minute, my flesh and my heart fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. He realized in God he had way more than all the other people who seemed to be making it good in life. God is all you need. Salvation is knowing God is the greatest treasure of all. Laying up treasure in heaven by giving money, by giving time, by giving effort to the work of God is a wonderful thing, but to know him is the greatest treasure of all. And when that is our treasure, our heart will inevitably follow. All the worries will be put aside as long as God is honored. What difference does it make if my reputation is tarnished? So was that of my Savior. As long as God is honored, what difference does it make if I lose everything I ever had? So did Jesus, who gave up all the riches of heaven and became poor so that for our sakes he might become rich. God is the greatest treasure that there is. And I don't know what secrets your heart is hiding today that need to come out, need to be given to him, need to be submitted to his control. I just know we all have a lot of them. We're like Mary and Martha, you know, they're in Luke 10. Martha's out in the kitchen trying to do for Jesus. Mary is sitting at the feet of Jesus because she understood that's the treasure. Why worry? When you can pray. Why worry when you have the greatest treasure in the world? George Beverly Shea, remember the song he used to sing, I'd rather have Jesus than anything. We all love the song. The question is, do we understand it? I'd rather have Jesus than anything. I'd rather be his than have riches untold. I'd rather have Jesus than houses or lands, really. I'd rather be led by his nail-pierced hand. I'd rather have Jesus than men's applause. I'd rather be faithful to his dear cause. I'd rather have Jesus than worldwide fame. I'd rather be true to his holy name than to be the king of a vast domain and be held in sin's dread sway. I'd rather have Jesus than anything. Can you say that and mean it? Anxiety will leave your life when you can do that. Why not worry? Because it destroys God's peace. It defies God's perspective. It devalues God's provisions. It denies God's providence. It disavows God's parenthood. It deflates God's pleasure and it depreciates God's person. If you're willing to do all that, go for it. Worry your life away. Good by me. But I don't think that's where we really want to go, is it? Let's raise our sights higher, beloved, beyond the needs of the moment, beyond the requirements of tomorrow, beyond the horizon of this world into eternity where God is and Jesus with him. Let's put our trust in him. Victor Hugo said it this way one time. He said, have courage for the great sorrows of life and patience for the small ones. And when you have finished your daily task, don't worry. Go to sleep in peace. God is awake. A pretty good theology. In fact, 
It's great theology because it's the same thing that you find in Psalm 121, verse 3, where God says it this way, He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. He is always on the job. Don't depreciate him with worry. Enlarge him with trust. Let's pray. Father, this is a great challenge to us. We don't naturally do this. Our natural inclination is to make ourselves large and to make you small. And so we need your help. Lord, we need your help. We all need your help to put worry aside and to put you on the throne. And Father, we're going to sing a song in just a moment, but as we come to that time, we've been three weeks now looking at this subject, and you've hit us from a lot of different angles, every one of which says, don't worry, trust me. And I just want to ask, Lord, that right now in, in, in the hearts across our congregation that you, will, that you will put your finger on the place in each one of our hearts where we need to say, okay, I've been owning it. I've been keeping this. I've been, I've been, I've been putting my arms around this and not letting God have it. I have insisted that it must be my way or it's the wrong way. I have worried. I've been anxiety-ridden. I have sinned. I ask that right now, Lord, you would help us to give that over to you. And then, Lord, help us not to walk out the door and take it back. But help us to keep praying keep rejoicing, and then watch and see what you're going to do. In some cases, we'll think it's wonderful. In some cases, we'll think it's awful. But the truth is, it'll be exactly what you know we need and exactly what will glorify you. That's at the core of our being. That's what we want. We pray for it. Pray for it in Jesus' name. Amen.